International Policy Couch, a weekly program hosted by Les Vermezari. The exchange of prisoners and the telephone conversation between U.S. President Barack Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro pushed to establish diplomatic relations after more than half a century of tension. U.S.-Cuban relations will include the opening of embassies, expanding travel and trade, and encouraging investment between the U.S. and Cuba. However, those measures do not end the embargo, which requires congressional approval. Our guest in our weekly program, International Policy Code, is Peter Servalas, Professor of Political Science and Director of Latin American and Latino Studies Program, Wake Forest University. Your main research themes are Latin American politics, electoral systems, legislative politics, and election. Professor Siervelis, welcome to our program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, the United States has constantly tried to shape Cuba's policies and its internal politics. Former President Fidel Castro's goal was to end American influence by aligning with major powers, the Soviets. Cuban independence from the United States required a dependence on other countries. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, most Americans, I don't think, understand the long and fraught history that the United States has with Cuba, the number of times that the island's been invaded, how much influence the United States has had politically and economically and historical perspective. And this is also the rationale that really pushed Cuba into the arms of other great powers, um, in the case of the Soviet Union and other more minor powers in the case of Venezuela more recently. Uh, so in this sense, the consistent policy of the Cuban government has actually worked quite well, right, by aligning with the Soviets and um, as, as a counterbalance to United States power and keeping U.S. influence off the island for all these many years since the revolution. It's been nearly 20 years since former President Bill Clinton convened the first summit of the Americas in Miami, uh, bringing together leaders of every country in the hemisphere except Cuba. What about the upcoming Panama summit? Will Cuba be present for the first time? Yes, it appears that Cuba is going to attend for the first time, and I think this is going to be a wider reflection of the changing dynamic of relationships between the United States and Latin America. There's always been sort of mixed relationships that countries have had with the United States, some warmer in the case of Chile and Brazil, some more difficult in the case of Venezuela, Bolivia, Argentina. But I think what we're going to find is one of the universal sticking points was U.S. policy towards Cuba. This is going to be one of Obama's most important legacies in terms of um, international affairs and foreign relations, is reasserting the role of the United States in the Americas and also improving the image of the United States. Just by this one stroke of the pen, Latin American U.S. relations have been improved substantially. Professor, tell us what was behind the release of Alan Gross, along with the release of another person held in Cuba and uh, three convicted Cuban held in the United States. Um, I think what was going on there was uh, a bit behind the scenes series of negotiations to uh, really build a kind of global universal agreement where there can be numerous prisoner exchanges. Um, so Alan Gross has been released. The three remaining members of the so-called Cuban Five spy ring uh, will be released in exchange for this U.S. intelligence asset that's been jailed in Cuba for, for almost 20 years. Um, also, this has been a key individual in the intelligence community in Cuba. It's the person who fingered, for example, Ana Belén Montes as a, uh, as a spy, a woman who worked in the Defense Intelligence Agency, as well as Kendall Myers and his wife, Gwendolyn, who were Cuban agents working within the U.S. government. So there's a series of exchanges going on in this overall package deal that we're going to see in, in coming weeks. We'll see the results of it. Uh, professor, does Cuba need better relations with the United States? I think it does. Uh, um, I think this is going to serve both countries. Right now, Venezuela is entering a deep economic crisis, uh, and I would imagine a political crisis that's uh, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, the extent of Cuban support from an, uh, an outside power is going to begin to, to diminish, and uh, Cuba's going to need an influx of investment, an influx of economic activity, because I don't think there's a, a power out there that Cuba's going to be able to depend on anymore in the way that it had historically first the Soviet Union and then Venezuela. At the same time, uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, I yes. think this provide enormous economic opportunities for a lot of businesses that are eager to uh, get a foothold on the island. Professor, will President Obama face opposition in Congress to attempt to improve the relations with Cuba? 
knowing that there are two powerful senators of Cuban descent, right. namely uh, Robert gonna... Mendez and uh, Marco Rubio. That's right. I think he's going to face opposition from those particular hardliners. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's important to remember that this particular policy is going to make for some strange bedfellows when it comes to potential alliances in Congress. For example, there may be some on the far left that will continue to oppose an opening with Cuba based on some human rights considerations, and then certainly on the far right, um, the, the members of Congress that you mentioned. However, in the center, I think there's the potential to build a coalition of pro-business Republicans along with uh, moderate Democrats that are eager to see improved relations. And I think through carefully building a coalition, uh, there could potentially be action to lift the embargo, because there's some powerful business mm -hmm. interests behind uh, the move to open the island to U.S. investment. Do you expect Venezuela continue to supply oil to Cuba at discounted prices? I think it will continue for the short term, but mm -hmm. I think what we're going to have to do is wait and see what happens in Venezuela, in Venezuela because... You know, anti-American sentiment is a central rallying cry of the Maduro government in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And with the elimination of the embargo, part of the rationale for anti-U.S. sentiment is going to evaporate because this is, again, a central issue in U.S.-Latin American relations. So in that sense, it's going to remain to be seen what happens in Venezuela at the end of this government because certainly a more conservative government, if it were to take power in Venezuela, would cut those supplies to the island, or at the discounted rate, mm -hmm. at the very least. Yeah. Uh, what do the Cubans have to offer to the United States? I think what the Cubans have to offer to the United States is uh, fundamentally a, a market near the United States. Uh, I think the Cubans also have uh, the potential to offer a key entry into, into Latin America in the sense that relations across the continent are going to be improved by this action. And that is something that the Cubans can provide for the United States. Okay. Uh, professor, a last question. What is the next step in improving relations? Is removing Cuba from the American list of state sponsors of uh, uh, terrorism in the agenda of discussions? Absolutely. That's going to be the first issue on the agenda. Because it's ironic, um, you know, we're talking about uh, sponsorship of terror, we're talking about human rights abuses, when some of the most egregious human rights abuses are taking place uh, in Guantanamo, which is controlled by the United States. Uh, so in this sense, I think a lot of this, um, uh, you know, a lot of this talk about the evils of the Cuban state are counterbalanced by what's happening in Guantanamo. And I do think at the same time that we have to look at what is actually occurring in the world to judge whether a country is a sponsor of terror around the world. And I think with some careful examination, we're going to see that Cuba has ceased to be taking action in, in, in that role. I think there was an argument for it to have been a sponsor or a supporter of terrorism around the world, let's say in the 1980s. But right now, clearly, I think that is not something the Cuban state is engaged in from my perspective. Paul Peter Cervillas, Professor of Political Science and Director of Latin American and Latino Studies, thank you for being our program. It was a pleasure to be with you today.